Deacon Givens, was that you who said you were willing to pray? Yes. Wonderful. And we bow our heads. Oh, dear Lord, we just thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for another glorious day, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for being in our lives, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for Central Baptist Church. We thank you for this wonderful leadership that we have. We thank you that Central is a teaching church in addition to being a preaching church. Lord, we thank you for Reverend Ajuja as she leads this lesson this evening, Lord Jesus. We ask you to allow us to help us to be able to put aside all our cares and worries of this day and to be able to focus on your word so that we can draw closer to you, so that we can be more like you. We ask and consider all these things done in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. Okay, I have an opening question for you. And I want to hear everyone's thoughts on it or as many people as possible. Um, if you could sum up your faith, what you believe, what you believe about Jesus, what you believe about God, what you believe about Christianity in one sentence. How would you summarize your faith in a sentence? Miss Loretta, you're on mute. I believe God is a healer because he healed me. There it is, one sentence. I believe God is a healer because he healed me. Anyone else? How would you summarize your faith in a sentence? Anyone else? And, and it can be a little hard. Think about how do I, you know, all the theological claims we have, how do I summarize this in one sentence, Natalie? I'll, I'll say protector. He protects me from myself. Mm, that's good. God is my protector. If you summarize your entire faith in a sentence, what would you say? You know, sometimes people, you may, you may bump into somebody at Walmart and they, they don't have time to hear, um, you know, a whole theological doctrine on, um, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit, uh, the doctrine of the church. What would you say in a sentence? He left the 99 for me. He <laughs> left the 99 for you. I like it. I like it. Um, who uh, else? I, I'd say, uh, Jesus is my rock, the foundation of my life. I love it. Jesus is my rock, the foundation of my life. Shelby, whether, did you have yeah, my God, my God is all loving and all powerful. My God is all loving and all powerful. Um, Natalie, is your hand up again or is your hand just still up from her? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me though? Because I can't. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, I this is a sentence that I've been. Uh, it's been kind of going around on my. We, we sang it again Sunday. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Mm, he's been my fourth man in the fire time after time. You would sum up your faith in a sentence. What would it be? Anybody else? Nancy, is your hand up? It is. It, okay, it, yeah. It, it is. I did have it up. Then when I was thinking about what Natalie was saying, I couldn't help but think about the fire. Um, so I, I, I got distracted and called back to God saving me. And um, I think I would sum up my faith by saying, I trust God. I trust God. Mm. That, that, that's good. That's good. Anybody else? How would you sum up your faith in a sentence? I was just thinking um, through many dangers, toils, toils and snares, I have already come. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes I think, <laughs> think in terms of songs, music, devotional, that kind of thing. So that was the first thing that came to mind. Nice. I love it. Anyone else? All right. I'm going to read a sentence. It's going to allude to what we're going to discuss today. 
this is this person's sentence. I'm gonna read it slowly and see if you agree with it, okay? I'm, gonna, I'm moving this so I can make sure I can read from this uh, screen over here, okay. The sentence is, or is everybody, has everybody braced themselves? To follow God, oh, I'm sorry, to follow Jesus, reject God. Huh. Mm. To follow Jesus, reject God. Mm -mm. Initial thoughts. No. My initial thought was, what are you talking about? <laughs> okay. No. How do you do that? <laughs> Today, we're going to talk about Christian atheists. Christian atheists. Christian atheists. Christian atheists. Wow. I know we learn new terms every day. Every day. The Christian atheist. What does it mean? Uh, what what might you suppose it means to be a Christian atheist? Hmm. Yes. Believe, but don't believe. Believe, believe. Okay, what would you believe in? What wouldn't you believe in? I would say a disbelief in a triune God. A disbelief in a triune God. What would you probably believe? If you were a Christian atheist, we're not saying that you are, but a, what would a Christian atheist probably, what would they, if they don't believe in a triune God, what would they believe in? In Christ alone. In Christ alone. Okay. Anyone else? What would a Christian atheist believe? I'm thinking they believe that Jesus was alive, but they don't believe his message. They believe that he was alive, but they don't believe his message. Okay. What do we think? What is a Christian? What might a Christian atheist believe? I hear a lot of people say higher power, whatever that is. <laughs> whoever that is up there, maybe they believe in him or her. Uh, the higher power. Um, Christian atheist. Anyone else? I see. How many people are utterly perplexed? I am confused. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's it. Good. Good. That means we're going to have a good discussion today. All right. So I'm going to, um, as always in this series, as we talk about different religions and different faiths and different sects, I, um, I, I do not espouse to know everything about this, nor do I espouse um, to uh, follow this, but here we go. We're gonna we're gonna follow the information and we're gonna have a conversation about it so we can best understand that everyone doesn't believe like us and we can at least understand what people believe, why they believe it. And that will also give us an opportunity to be able to better minister to them. So here we go. Christian atheists embrace the teachings, the narratives, the symbols, the practices or communities associated with Christianity without accepting the literal existence of God. Hmm. One, more, one more time for my people in the back. Christian atheists embrace the teachings, narratives, symbols, practices, or communities associated with Christianity without accepting the literal existence of God. Hmm. All right, let's keep that. Christian atheists take many forms. It may include an ethical system, include cultural Christianity in a variety of Christian theological positions, right? So you have several prominent Christian atheists. Um, Thomas J.J. Alzertzer, I may be pronouncing that wrong, who said, so these, these quotes are interesting, okay. He said, who said God died, um, who said God died with Jesus? That's what he said. John Caputo, who said, God represents a call to embracing unconditional values such as justice and forgiveness. So they like the fact that Jesus talked about justice and forgiveness. So we can follow that part, right? William Hamilton, who advocated the following, um, advocated following the teaching of Jesus, just the teaching. And then this other guy, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce his name because it looks um, East European and I just, I can't do it with all the, uh, I just, I'm not going to be able to pronounce it well. But this is what he said. The only way to be an atheist is through Christianity. What? Mm. The only way to be an atheist is through Christianity. 
That's what he said. Um, okay, one more. And a guy named Peter Raw uh, Rollins who said um, Peter Rollins who rejects religious systems that purport to resolve doubt or anxiety. Anyway, okay. So Christian atheists they follow Jesus but reject God. Mm. Now I know you. Th there may not you may not know anybody who identifies themselves as a Christian atheist. However, I think if we take some time, we may identify people who may not claim to be Christian atheists, but mm -hmm. may in actuality and in practice align closer to them than one might than even they may espouse okay so we're going to mm -hmm. talk about four principles that they say they believe in and then we're going to go in reverse order and try to see if we can figure out if we can see what they see because we're trying to put ourselves in the foot of somebody who practices something different all right so there are, first of all there are different schools of christian atheists um, but these are the typical four common beliefs, generally speaking. One, the assertion of the unreality of God for our age, including the understanding of God, which have been a part of Christ a traditional Christian theology. So the God of our age doesn't exist. Whether that means at some point there was a God in the past or the God of the past doesn't relate to the God of the future or now, there's an issue with traditional Christian theology in the way that God relates to people now. That's issue number one. Issue number two, and the insistence upon coming to grips with contemporary culture as a necessary feature of responsible theological work goes quite in line with the first one. That is to say that there is a belief that some people are so stuck in the past. They are so stuck in the Bible, in its historical context, that they do not relate it to things that are happening now. So whenever there's preaching and teaching going on, because it doesn't relate to what's going on now, it no longer has value. Right. And contemporary in, in that contemporary culture should like it theolo theology should address um sorry should address theological culture. Sorry, my mom's coming in. I'm like seeing a baby. Everything okay? Uh, uh if you can stay quiet because we're doing Bible study. Um my mom's trying to jump into Bible study. Okay, jump on in. We're talking about Christian atheists. Okay. All right, so that's that's number two. Number three a varying degree in forms of alienation from the church as it is constituted. Basically meaning that people got a problem with the church. Mm -hmm. We'll get into that in a moment. And the fourth one, which is exceptionally interesting, the recognition of the centrality of the person of Jesus in theological reflection, which is all to say that these people who say they are atheists find Jesus utterly compelling. They find his teaching exceptionally compelling. Though they are atheists, they want to follow what Jesus said, at least kind of. Because we also know Jesus made lots of statements about faith and belief. But there's, mm -hmm. but there's still something that is compelling to them. So I ask you, what would, what, um, would you say is com so compelling about Jesus that even an atheist might be interested. What do you find compelling about Jesus that even an atheist might find that compelling? Anyone? I don't what know do how you how to answer that. You're saying what what do we find compelling about what Jesus? You, yeah, what do you find? Oh, what is okay. so compelling okay. to Jesus, the life of Jesus, the work of Jesus, what Jesus did, that even an atheist would say, Yeah, that was that was pretty good. Yeah, I, I give him that. I'll that give Jesus. He that. loves everybody. And Jesus right. loves everybody, right? That is compelling. The fact how Jesus loved people is compelling, even to an atheist. 
Um, what else is compelling about Jesus? Love your enemies. Say that, you said love your enemies? Yes. Yeah, that Jesus, it's not even just love the people you like, love the people you are raised with, to love people who do you wrong. That is compelling to mm -hmm. even an atheist. What else? If y'all are wondering, the, my child the, is sick. The, the, the right peace, now. the peace you you feel from his spirit when you're when you're near them, you don't get that anywhere else. All right. Now I'm not sure if the atheist would say there's a peace from his spirit, but maybe there's peace in the teachings. There's something that's yeah. so compelling about what he says that afterwards you feel comforted. You feel at ease. Maybe they, I would say they probably would push back on spirit language, but you know, there's some mm -hmm. people that you talk to and after you talk to them, you just feel better. Yeah. And there's something about his teaching where you just feel better after you hear the words of Jesus. Um, what else? What is compelling about Jesus? His conversation about, um, People who hear the word of the God, the word, the word of, well, hear his word. And uh, he compared it to, you know, uh, the soil, you know, that the soil, the, they, they might have been, the word might have been planted, but it didn't grow because the soil was too thin or something. I can't remember it word for word, but it's, I think that's compelling though, the way he talked about how we, all of us receive the word differently. Some of it, us don't, it doesn't even penetrate others. It penetrates, but last, and then others uh, on our good soil. So right. the word, you know, really blossoms with us, the ones that are considered good soil. I mean, no, I I, go ahead. With telling. No, I I absolutely agree with you. Um, I agree with in that particular instance, and I agree with you on parables and teachings that he would have general generally, like the way he taught, the way he used illustrations, the way he broke things down in a way that people could just understand, and you could bring theology down where it's not haughty and it's not all the way up here, but it just makes sense. Um, Nancy. Thank you. Um, I would say something that to me is compelling as I reflect on that question. He didn't command or mandate that anybody follow him. He invited everybody. He was inclusive in every way he behaved. Um, I think that's compelling. Yeah, the idea of invitation being the primary way to communicate your faith, right? I'm not mandating you you doing this. I'm really I'm inviting you to participate. You are welcomed at this table. Like that is a very radically different model than a lot of other. And that if you want to be at this table, you can come because you're invited. That is radically different than a lot. Of, we talked about um, Scientology last week. There's not nearly as many invitations to that table, right? But the fact there is an open invitation that that is the model and that invitation is for anybody. That is compelling. That is very compelling, even to an atheist, perhaps. What else might be compelling, even to an atheist? I'm going to throw this out there. Uh, his forgiveness of sin. Now, an atheist may not say he has the ability to forgive sin, but the idea that he suggests that we should be forgiven okay, and that we should continuously forgive and that we can be released from the guilt of forgiveness is huge, okay. right? Yes. Like the idea and that we're called to forgive others, right? Yes. We don't just hold oughts against people. We just can't, you know, um, be mad forever that we are called to forgive and that when we mess up, we can be forgiven. Mm -hmm. That Okay, that's very compelling even to an atheist. What about he 
He's a way maker and a promise keeper. He's a way maker and a promise keeper. Now, for the way, so I would, yes, but I would say an atheist would probably not say that in a miraculous way. Mm -hmm. Some of those atheists, they typically don't believe in the miraculous. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we look at, you know, being a way maker, you know, potentially being God is miraculously going to step in. Uh, an atheist may say, yeah, you saw that as miraculous, but you really, you know, you got the five, you got the check in the mail right when you needed it. But the atheist is going to say, what you don't realize is that you overpaid and the insurance just paid you back. <laughs> okay. It's just coincidence that it was good time. Mm -hmm. But, and even in the teachings, they may still affirm that there's an understanding that you can gain. So the way maker and a promise keeper that he's consistent and he seems consistent. So maybe pieces of that, but probably not from the standpoint of the miraculous, but maybe from the standpoint of the practical, but I can still see that there are still pieces of that, but from the, now I, I affirm everything you said, Ms. Loretta, but from the standpoint of an atheist, they may not go all the way there. Um, but we can see that even from the standpoint of an atheist, that there are things that would be exceptionally compelling. Mm -hmm. about Jesus, right mm -hmm. even just from this perspective of an atheist okay let's go up because we're going in reverse order for their four tenets um alienation from the church why would somebody feel alienated from a church and why would somebody potentially be a christian atheist because they are alienated from the church because they want to have a sin and god because they want to have their sin in God. Um, but they don't want God. They said they, ain't, they, said they ain't no God. No My God. fault, Jesus. They want Jesus. They want Jesus. <laughs> they want to have Jesus and their sin. Okay. So the church may be a place that would call out and address their sin. And they don't want to have that. Okay. And so they feel alienated. Anyone else? Why might someone feel alienated from the church um, and become a Christian atheist? Uh, maybe because they're LBGQ. Right. Maybe they're LGBTQ. They do not feel welcomed and maybe um, probably do not feel affirmed. And so they do not think that this, the church is a place of belonging for them. <clears throat> and so as their identity, as they identify in a way that seems countercultural to many Christians, I will fully say not all Christians believe that there is an issue with LGBTQ. There are many denominations and many pieces of different denominations, almost every major denomination that has a group that believes. So I, I, I throw that out there because people assume that like conservative Christianity has a market on everything. Mm -hmm. um, but just like there's Southern Baptist, there's the Alliance of Baptists, right? And they believe different things about this. But it's but generally speaking, we know that people who are part of the LGBTQ community have experienced hardships in church because people do not agree or the church may not agree with their lifestyle. They don't feel like there's a place where they can identify with the church. And maybe if they can't belong in the church, maybe they don't belong with the church's God, but they still like the teachings of Jesus. Mm. Okay. Anyone else? Why might someone who feels alienated from the church become a Christian atheist. If they feel that church people don't do what they say. They don't <clears throat> feel church people do what they say. Or what mm -hmm. what, what is being preached. Or, or what, what is, is being preached. They're inconsistent. They're hypocrites. Right. <laughs> and and not only do I not want your church, I don't want your God because if there was a God you wouldn't be acting like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there really was a God, y'all would behave better. Yeah. And so since y'all don't behave like there's a God, there probably isn't one. But I still like the teachings of Jesus, even though y'all don't follow them. <laughs> um, any, anyone else? The church don't feel welcoming, inviting, it's cold, or the church doesn't feel welcoming, inviting. The church feels cold. It doesn't feel like a place that, that wants me. 
And if it's hard to envision that God wants me or that there is a God, if the people of God don't want me. Mm. Y'all claim to be the people of God. The people of God don't want me. God must not even really be a God because it doesn't, it seems counterintuitive. Something, something seems off. How they know that you don't want it? Oh, there's ways that people can know. You can, and everything is indirect, right? Y'all just hear that child in the background. Um, yeah. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe, maybe I'll pick them up at the end so y'all can see them. Um, but yeah, you know, some things, you know, are done subtly, you know. Oh, you wore that to church. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yep. Or some things, you know, you look at somebody and you kind of like, don't you know you're supposed to stand up at this point? You like kind of, you give them the look like, oh, this is the him. We stand up. Why are you sitting down? Right? Because they're supposed to know that like, oh, if we're being reverent, if we're honoring God at this moment, you stand up when this could be their first time at the church, or maybe they've just never been told, or maybe they don't understand, or maybe they're, maybe, maybe, maybe their knees hurt. Maybe they're in pain. Right? But we don't, we don't recognize what they're going, what's going on. And we presume things. And so we make pronouncements on people. Um, anyone else? Um, why Maybe might they just don't know God? Say that again. Maybe they just don't know God. Maybe they just, maybe there just hasn't been in a relationship established um, where they just, they just don't know God. And there's just this separation. There hasn't been a connection to the church or to God, right? And we live in a society where people are unchurched. We talked about this several weeks ago when we talked about atheism in general. We live in a society where people are unchurched. They're de-churched. They don't hang out at the church. And so the assumption also, if you're unchurched, is that there's probably not a lot of people pouring into you about your connection and your faith with God. And so maybe that's just not there, right? Maybe sometimes it's also. You just want to say something? Go for it. I was thinking maybe sometimes they feel like there isn't like enough grace for them to even learn what it's like to become a Christian or the beginning stages of them trying to walk that life out and then having the experience of someone being able to teach them that or show them the way of some sort. Maybe they feel like there's just not enough grace for them to even figure it out. Because once you walk through the doors, yeah, I can hear you though. The understanding is you should you should have yourself together. Okay. Yep. So, okay. We're kind of we, two areas where we can kind of, as much as we push back, oh, why be a Christian atheist? We're seeing why somebody, maybe we're not saying that we are, but we're, we're putting ourselves in their shoes. All mm -hmm. right. Number two, going in reverse order. The insistence upon coming to grips with contemporary culture as a necessary feature of responsible theological work. Have you ever been to a church or listened to a sermon or been a part of a teaching and nothing, and it didn't hit anything that was happening in your life? Like it was so up here that it addressed nothing going on. Like that was, that's really great for then, but how, what does that do for me now? Right? And so there's some people who would espouse that there is no such thing as this, as social justice, right? Because all we need to worry about is getting to heaven. So God's not concerned about what's going on right now. And even if he's concerned, he's really concerned about your soul. He's not concerned about your life. He's not concerned about how you live. He's not concerned. So the ideal of justice is something that is um, for the other side of the kingdom of God once you get to heaven, but not for here. And so because people have espouted these things and said these things and suggested that, you know, we should be focused on the heavenly hereafter, as opposed to how God is and how God is moving in our lives right now, there are people who say, uh, it doesn't, God is not even concerned about what's happening right now. If God's not concerned about what's happening right now, then God's not relevant. What do you think? Can you think of any other reasons why people are insisting on contemporary culture being a necessary part of theological reflection? Is it necessary? Does God have to address the, uh, the contemporary culture? Is that something that we should address in the church? 
that we should hear from the pulpit that God should be concerned about? Are we just good with whatever we heard, you know, good old days, good old traditional, you know, the same word yesterday is as good as it is today. We don't need to, we don't need to worry about anything contemporary. No, I think. No, because. Yeah, we need to be yeah. contemporary because if you, we're not, then we don't tr attract uh, the people of today's culture. Right. How can we attract the people? who are going through stuff right now, if we're not addressing it. Mm -hmm. Who else was saying something? I was saying that, that you know, God is alive and, and here and now. So, so yeah, we're, we're dealing with what's going on here and now because he's right here with us. <clears throat> right, so, I was thinking of, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was thinking of in a way like, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. The Bible has traveled through many centuries, and I get that there is a younger generation that has a hard time understanding things in a certain way, but I do believe the message of God can reach anyone. I think it just depends on the delivery. All right, Nancy. I think that's one of the greatest miracles of our faith, in my opinion, hmm. that as when the Holy Spirit descended and everybody could understand people of all different languages, all different cultures, yet they all received the message that they needed to receive. I feel as if that happens on such a regular basis. In my experience with Central Baptist Church, when I know that you or a pastor or whoever's preaching that word at that time, I'm hearing it through my lived experience, it's very personal to me. It's very current events because it's my life. Mm -hmm. I also know that everybody else on this call is hearing it through their own personal experience. Mm -hmm. So one of the miracles is that I feel like that Holy Spirit is descending on all of us all the time that we can, that we can hear and apply in our own reality, the word to take us forward on the path that we're each meant to be traveling. And it is different for all of us. And yeah. every day is different. Oh, <laughs> That's God. why we need to spend every day with, with some time in the word, I think, so that we can be reminded of what's really relevant in our daily lives. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Sure. Thanks for the anyone else why is it so important to address now and 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 even though we've kind of said it's important to address why is there pushback with addressing contemporary culture sometimes how about that question i'm sorry can you explain uh contemporary culture i mean this is gonna this is this is gonna probably range and mean something different to different people but we're kind of addressing current events right um so current could for you could be what's going on this week um, so it's interesting that, you know, um, when Pastor Riley preached, he talked about protests that got into the sermon because that's currently what's going on on college campuses. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but it could also be um, issues that are pertinent, just kind of in the in the season or in the moment. And so um, it could be talking about, you know, the expression uh, Deacon Gibbons brought up earlier of LGBTQ persons and like, where does that fit in? into the gospel or does it, or, you know, how should we respond? How do we welcome? How do we like, what is the response? Right. So that is something, especially within our culture, um, that is very significant And the church seems to be at a different place. And then sometimes the church seems to have no response at all. And all so right. you know, how do we address that? So you mean like current events, politics, stuff like that? Politics, current, uh, current events. I mean, it also can maybe stuff that's going on in your home. Right. And uh, so, you know, it may be that you're having challenges with a sibling or relationships and struggles. So, I mean, like all of the whole gamut. So not okay. just the things that are like socially and things that are in the public fear, but things that are also personal, like the, your contemporary culture may be the fact that you don't like your, your boss right now. Okay. And how are we supposed to address the fact that I got to go to work and make money when oh, that I think man, I understand that. you said, okay. Okay, I think I get what you're trying to say. Okay. So there's, a, so I mean, all of that, all of oh, it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I get it. 
But why do people sometimes push back on including contemporary culture in, in, in conversations when it comes to preaching and teaching? Because a lot of people feel like, I mean, I don't want to say just old school or traditional, but a lot of people believe that preaching should only be about Jesus. So, you know, when you start getting into, you know, breaking down people's personal lives and what you're going through and what's happening in the world, people feel like you, you that ain't that ain't supposed to be in the pulpit. So, I, I mean, I think that's a that's an opinion. That ain't my opinion. I'm just assuming that's probably where the pushback come from. Yeah, I mean, so there was someone, I, I don't have it off the top of my head. He, oh my gosh, there was so much pushback on this post he had. It's a pastor out there. And he was basically, the pulpit has no place for politics. It has no place, um, you know, for um, for relationships. There's no, it was like, it was just the place for Jesus. I'm like, what do you think Jesus talked about, friend? Right. <laughs> what do you think he was talking about? Right. Um, yeah, you know, some people we just we we just want to tell the story of Jesus, but what part of the story? Because even if we're talking about the story of Jesus, Jesus dealt with the things that were happening at his time. Right. And so it becomes to me a little disingenuous. Um, but I think maybe people don't like to do it because it's hard, yeah, right? Because mm -hmm. contemporary culture often asks questions that we haven't answered already. Right. Right. And so, um, how do we address things? that happen um, that when the times have changed and we're like, but the Bible hasn't changed right. and our values haven't necessarily changed. But so here we go. I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna bring to you an issue. We did this at noon. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna address it. I'm gonna, and we're, we're gonna have a healthy dialogue. And no one's gonna cuss and fuss. And <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um so um but this is something that's happened recently and this kind yeah. of addresses probably two three and four <laughs> i think jennifer says uh oh because she already knows she's on staff and she's seen the concerns so over um the last couple of weeks i've received some messages of disciples who are concerned um, because there is someone who has been breastfeeding their child at church, uncovered. What say, what say what? thee? Uncovered. uncovered. Oh, <laughs> uh. <laughs> so, right. So this is an issue of contemporary culture, right? Because yeah. what, how yeah. this has been addressed in the past is this different than how we address it now? So, okay. So, what say thee? I'm going to try to hold back my thoughts. I mean, if I had to put an opinion on it, I get that that's a new thing where, you know, I should be able, this is a natural thing. I get that, right? But uh, as a woman, mm -hmm. I do I do think that it's important to have some form of modesty in front of people that are not in your bed chamber on a regular okay. or see your body, you know, beyond clothing. So I think that, I mean, I get the, that it's a natural thing, but I also feel like, there should be some form of privacy when it comes to your bosom being out. Okay. So, so are you saying that breastfeeding uncovered? Uncovered. Maybe she didn't know no better. Maybe. Right. Right. Say, wait, no, no. Let's say, say more on that. What does it mean that she doesn't know any better? You think she's no unaware that she's uncovered? Her. No one had told her. Oh no. No. oh, no. Somebody told her. Someone made her very aware. You that she was cover uncovered, it. that they could provide her with a cover. She did not want to cover. Oh, no. She did not want to move. Oh, she God. was in context. She's on the back row of the balcony. Uncovered. I was going to oh. ask the balcony. Huh? I was going to ask if she was If she's the on the back row of the balcony, she did that deliberately because she knew that there would be people who objected. Okay, so maybe, maybe it's the case that she was intentional on the back row of the balcony so she yeah. could feed her child, but well, also be come to church. some level of modest, some level of discretion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, doesn't the level of discretion come with covering though? That's the discretion. I mean, um, that's, ooh, well, that's, that's, certainly oh goodness, a, that's, that's certainly a position, but it's not necessarily um, 
discretion discretion could be I'm just removing myself because y'all are supposed to be looking forward. What about respecting herself and others just around her? Maybe, uh, maybe she uh, has great respect, respect for herself. Perhaps yeah. she has great respect for herself and she doesn't sexualize her body like you're not supposed to because God right. gave her the ability to but, create food for her child. Ask somebody that I don't, I, I, I exclusively pump. But every time somebody says, oh my gosh, Prince is getting so big, I say, yeah, I did that. I did that. <laughs> I did that, right? Because God developed, created my body to be able to produce life for my son. Right. And that's what God did. But what man did is sexualize my body. That's but right. That's, let's be in reality, though. Men do view women's body sexually. That's automatic. That's what they were made to do. So <laughs> were they made no, to do that? I mean, yes, that's what I, 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 I said it was made to do that. That's not what I one mean. At only, one at a time. Only in America. Women, oh. women, nurse in other countries Correct. without it being an issue. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. In churches and every place. It is only in America that we have sexualized or in some European spaces where we've sexualized women like that. Right. So for a woman to nurse her baby un uncovered, maybe her baby is hot. Maybe oh. her baby can't nurse all covered up. Wait, hold on. Let's maybe the baby's Wait, hold on. Oh, Shelby, hold up. <laughs> Shelby, context, because I've been giving you guys pieces and clues. She has more than one baby. So there's a young one and there's an older one. So let's imagine the other baby is closer to two. You manage a two-year-old covered. Maybe and he can too. walk up and un in every other space, they will walk up and uncover it for themselves. This then, is his, that's right. This is his milk source. My great niece used to do it all the time with my niece. So let me give you some more context to just things to think about. How often do babies eat? All the time. No, Can you always tell when a baby's going to be hungry? Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you, no. No babies are hungry when they're hungry. It all the time. Right? We knew when it was time for them to eat. You know when it's time for them to eat because they make noise, but do you always know that yeah. they're about to be hungry? And they eat yeah. more at church so they can be quiet. Right, so maybe they're trying. You trying to maybe they're not even that hungry. Maybe you're trying to shut that child up. Praise God. Right. See, right now we letting the child talk in the background. But if I needed to feed, if I needed to be make him quiet, I know what to do. We give give Bye. him some milk. Right mm -hmm. now, how easy would it be as she is in the balcony in the back to go down the stairs with two children? Right. Mm -hmm. Is it practical for something that may take ten minutes for her to have right. a long journey mm -hmm. just to get it? Mm -mm. Right, and to then go through the church with the baby screaming. Right, How is it better? Is it better to quiet that. the baby quickly? Right, yeah. right. I don't, I don't understand why it's so hard. I mean, nobody says she had to run downstairs and nothing like that. But what is what the difference here for me is? Why was it so hard for her to cover? I don't understand why exactly. that's a problem. So, okay, it's yeah. a matter. It's yeah. a matter yeah. of purse. She's probably it's looking. At it's a matter of personal Hold preference. Hold yeah, on. And it can be a matter so of Jennifer, style. Okay, so again, so Jennifer said it's a matter of personal preference. Tracy mm. also said it's a matter of the child. Again, you have an older child. That child, the ideal of the child being covered may not be practically like realistic. You mm. also don't know if the child has other sensitivities where that's it's just it's not practically even young children don't always they uh uh do you you let me tell you the time you want my son will basically punch you out when he's hungry okay it, everything is moving right okay it's, so but here here's here's a bigger question what's the most important thing happening in that moment when the, the baby, screen is at church yeah. the mother is with the she child came in to church. church that's the most important thing she came to church for what to hear the word to, hear to, the word, to learn to worship, to worship. Okay, mm -hmm. so I've been told, what? Why can't she worship in the bathroom? Oh no! Mm -hmm. <laughs> they gonna say something if she went in there. Mm -hmm. So let's say they she goes to the bathroom, and in the women's room, at least we have a couch. I can't right. tell you how often it's right. clean. Yeah, but there's a couch in there. But is there a way to actually see what's going on in worship? 
No. 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 And there was somebody who suggested, oh, you can go to the health room. Is there a way to hear or hear or, or see what's going on in worship? No. Or know where it is. Right. And, you, <laughs> and, you still it is. Have, and you still have to make that trek from the second floor all the way down those rickety steps mm -hmm. with two babies. It would be good. It'd be good and, if get, just... and, and I just don't understand because when I see a woman nursing a child, I don't think, oh my God, put those away. Of course. I mean, that's that's what those are for. It's okay, literally how that's, God that's, created that's, them. It's literally, she is using them with the purpose that God that's gave them. Okay, for. okay, that is true. But the world we live in today, we're not in ancient times, we're not in no other country, none of that. If we think about where we are right now and the and the and the predicament or where she was at at the at the moment, if we think about where we are right now, that I'm not saying it's wrong. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm also saying there should be some kind of thought process there. It shouldn't just be no, all. Oh, it is what it is. I'm feeding my baby. You know oh, what I'm saying? Okay. Because so I have a question. Can she be lost in worship? Can she be caught up in the moment and have her mind fixed on the way God is speaking to her in that moment? Wait, okay, and it's I'm going to come to Regina in a moment. But I got a question because I want I want to throw a monkey wrench in there. Let's yeah. say a woman comes to church in a low cut shirt and her boobs are on the is anyone kicking her out of the church? No. Oh. I mean, I'm a nursing I mother. Say, I, I wouldn't say kick her out of the church because I was just talking about grace. You know what right. I'm saying? So I get that there should be some form of grace. But I'm saying like, is, you know. Is anyone asking her to move though? I don't know. That ain't my job. <laughs> I, I've, I've never seen it. I've never okay. seen anybody declare it to be their job because someone has a local church. I've seen people gossip about it. Um, I've never seen anybody at Central decide it was their job to tell a woman to move because she had a low cut shirt. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you, multiple people came up to this nursing mother who fed her child. Oh my God, Regina! I couldn't even see that from the from the choir stand. Regina, mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> when I, I just want to chime this part in, y'all, because it makes me think about how I reacted to a situation at work whereby I had an employee who was gay. And of course I did not treat him in any way different when it came to the work or anything like that. But what I did find offensive to me was on Monday morning when he would come in and tell me, Hey, this is what I did for the weekend. And me and Bob, we did. And I'm like, Oh my God. And I kind of liken this to that situation. I'm like, do what you have to do, but I don't have to know all that. Right. So if you got to take care of the baby, absolutely take care of the baby. But do I, why am I in your bed? Like, don't involve me in that. Oh, but and maybe that's not the way to look at it because I'm ignoring the situation. But I really didn't want to talk about what he did with him. And what, with the mother, I just feel like you got to do what you got to do. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so, but he, okay. So I, I get I it. So here, the, here, go ahead, Tracy. Go ahead. Tough comparison though to, a mom who is naturally feeding her child and that's the only way her baby eats is compared with a What's sexual that? act on the weekend? And I didn't she say sat as sexual. far back as she could. She sat all the way in the back. And, she yeah, I'm, say, and I'm saying the comparison just in this <laughs> narrative that Bob is telling you what he's doing. This woman is feeding her baby. <laughs> yeah, but to the same point, if we're talking about contemporary issues, mm -hmm. then why can't we be in contemporary times and provide what's needed for a nursing mother or a gay person or whatever? All I'm saying is that if we're truly going to address contemporary issues, then let's get contemporary. All right, let's, let's, contemporary. let's add, wait, hold on, let me address another level. Let's add another level to it. I love adding levels. The level <laughs> is in the state of in the state of Missouri, it is completely legal to breastfeed in public. Okay, well, I mean that's awesome. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't knock the breastfeed. That's what I'm saying. I don't, I don't knock that. All I'm saying is without a cover. I'm, I, I think that that's important. In my, just that's just the way I believe. I just believe. I know people saying the baby might be hot and all that. I don't think that's an issue for real. I mean, that's the baby got to eat. That's what the important oh, no, thing is, right? Yeah, yeah, I can tell you, it can be an issue. I mean, baby. the baby got to eat. That's what the important thing is. I don't know. You right. right. I ain't got no kids, so I can't tell you. You know what I'm saying? But I'm just, I'm just, I'm just speaking off my, 
you I mean my my opinion of it. You know what I'm saying? I, I get that you got a breastfeed <laughs> and everything, but if we talk about contemporary, it's other options if you in public if you want to make that choice. I'm not saying she got to. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just I'm just saying there are options. There are there are right. options. There are places that have lactation centers. Right. Ooh. But we and don't. Why can't, but why we does, don't. Why does it have to be on the body of the church to figure it out for each individual person? Is there any consideration for the person, for their environment? Oh, wait, hold, that is that is a wonderful question. But is it not the place of the church to consider hospitality of others? But I heard well, the conversation be about one. Right. I heard the conversation right. be about one, not others. Right. Right. May, right. May I, offer, I assure you, as may, somebody who has to pump at church, that I have to go right. out the street. We may, we will may may offer, offer, the we'll level may, of the we'll level, may, like the church does not have on the sanctuary I, side a place where I can make sure that I'm taken care of, and I have physical discomfort at times. That's right. Right. Oh, so sure. so may I offer? Can I offer something? Right. Oh, if we are talking inclusive environments. I can see why there could be a Christian atheist um, just because, um, and this is not a judgment of anybody, but these types of conversations where we are looking for ways to be less inclusive versus more inclusive. Exactly. I, I, I have nursed um, two out of three children. I have pumped in my car. I have pumped in the office. I have pumped everywhere and fed my kids everywhere. Sometimes I, I've covered Sometimes it's just, hey, I got to make sure that this kid, she's irritable or she's sick or she's something, and I got to do what I got to do. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I don't care. This is Cynthia's perspective. I don't care if you are gay, lesbian. I don't care if you nurse in public, covered or uncovered. What I care about most of all is showing you the love of Christ. I don't want to isolate you in any kind of way. And that is not saying that we have to cater to each and every individual situation. That's just saying that we have we ought to have enough grace for that moment to include that individual and to not judge them in a way that causes them to feel isolated. That's right. And I get you. I think that's important. I think you put right. But I think there's a form of protection as well. Not everybody is coming from a point of you need to do the right thing because this is how we feel. That ain't that's not at least that's not my perspective. I look of it as a protection as well because sometimes you don't know who around you and what type of people around you. Anybody can walk into a church. You don't know if they're godly or not. So that's just I mean, that's just my assumption. Yeah, I can give them the love of Christ, but I'm also gonna feel like, you know what? Do you want to cover or do you not? So I get why some women probably came over there to say, do you want to cover yourself? Do you not? Or whatever, because I, I get that there are many perspectives. I just think that it's important to, to know your surroundings as well. That's But you, so, like you said, the love of Christ is important, no doubt. So also she felt like she was in a protected environment. It was. It's not until somebody makes an issue of it that she does not feel protected, right? right? So... If I wear jeans or if I wear my little black dress, that still does not give a man consent to touch me at all. That's the issue of that man. That is not my issue. If I come into church with a with a low uh, or open shirt or what have you, like I get it, like because we're human beings and there we are fallen people, people will sexualize you in a way, but honestly, Men ought to control themselves or women ought to control themselves in a way that allows people to express themselves the way they need to express themselves. I've heard rumors that discipline is even like a requirement of Christianity. Yeah, sure is. And so, okay, so- How so, about that? So, <laughs> so here it is, here it is. Um, here are the concerns. Um, one, you know, somebody's feeding their child. Someone's feeding their child. And honestly asking them, uh, the, there's a convenience factor of the fact that it probably the child can be done and and settled before faster if they don't move. Then there's the question of the covering, which is honestly a preference or a conversation more on preference and potentially on need because you do not know the need of the individual. You do not know how the the child responds. You may know how your child responds. You may not be familiar. Many people don't breastfeed. Many people don't have, don't nurse their children. So you may be going based off of an experience that is not, which is completely different from the experience of the other person. 
My question is, how can we give somebody the utmost grace in this situation? And is it possible to just is it possible just to look forward? Right. Is it possible that when we go to church, we just keep our eyes on Jesus? Right. Because we don't, because is it worth the cost of this person saying, I wouldn't go to Central because those people didn't make me feel comfortable? Is it worth the, the potential loss in our witness? And I'm not saying it's not uncomfortable because y'all have probably noticed that you have not seen me nurse a child on the front row. And I get it because I've like I've had to nurse and I've had to pump and I do like and it's not it's not where I am. It's, and it's not my it's not my personal comfort level. Right. But there are things about the gospel that make us uncomfortable. There are things about G what Jesus did that made people uncomfortable. He included people that made other people uncomfortable. So the idea that you being comfortable is a narrative of Christian belief is not true. There are things that will happen that will expressly make you uncomfortable. That's true. So I'm not saying, it's not necessarily about being right or wrong because that's what's called being legalistic. But how can we just make sure, look, this woman has come multiple weeks feeding her children and being present do you know what kind of stamina it takes when people mm -hmm. decide to inform you and tell you how to use your body mm. and that you can, this woman is pressing to get to Jesus. And our biggest concern is, are you covered? What if our biggest concern, and I'm not saying, if maybe she didn't know her options. We know she knows her options. Maybe that was not her preference, but we know it's her preference. If we know it's her preference and we, and we know we have given her, her options, Leave her alone. the best option for us, even if it makes us a little uncomfortable, is to what? Leave her alone. Because this is the reason why people will say, I'll follow Jesus, but I'm not going to be part of your church. And she went in and I think that's okay. See you. She went to the back, thinking nobody would see her. Yeah. So how they see her? They should have been looking at the front if Ramali was preaching. They okay. should have been paying attention in. Now I'll tell you that if she was on the front row, like, uh, okay, that's a different. That's different. <laughs> right. That is different. That's yes, not what. And if we have to look at the intent of the individual, this person is all is upstairs, all the way in the back. In the back. Oh, what is so? What is what is her likely intention? Discretion. To 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 be unbothered. Mm -hmm. So is she mm -hmm. like she's trying to? She is just trying to get through with her two children. It is probably very hard to stay undistracted with two children. Just yeah. pulling at you, literally your body parts, because they hungry. That's, that's hard that's enough. Everybody, everybody take care of their own needs, right? That's what you're saying. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, my personal preference is that's probably not what I would do. But my, my bigger thing is I want people to get access to Jesus and I don't want to be a stumbling block for somebody else. But I just, I, I get what you're saying. I think that's true. But I feel like if, if, if a stumbling block from Jesus is you not being able to do what you want in certain <laughs> places, it's a problem. That mean, you not, I'm not, I'm not, okay. I'm just, all I'm saying is if you feel uncomfortable or you feel like, I'm sorry, I'm going to go that way. Let me go this way. I do believe that back in the day, there were a lot of elderly women who taught the younger women things yes. that they felt were, you know, uh, honorable in a church, right? Like not and, wearing pants and um, not having jeans in church. Not just okay. that. I'm saying how to how to present yourself the way a right. godly woman should or a Proverbs 30 woman should or, how, you know, however you believe God is, is if, if God want to see you that way, then that's the way you should be type thing, right? All I'm, I'm just, I'm, in my opinion, I think that it's kind of hard to when we start to include too many things in the church just to keep people there, then you start, I think things start to get watered down and we start to accept stuff we shouldn't. So, well, God, well, here, so you how, have to, we, how do we judge so, what's contemporary? So can, I can I offer this though? Uh, God put us in the garden naked and mm -hmm. it wasn't until they ate from the forbidden fruit that they knew that they were naked and were ashamed. God said that our bodies are beautiful. Walk this earth, cultivate the land, name these animals, do all of these things. You don't need no clothes because you're beautiful just the way I made you. And then we messed up. And What's then the on, and on top of us messing up, now we, we got all of this trauma that, that, that informs 
how we view the world and the people in it. And so I get it. Like there is there is a godly standard, right? So I, I won't I won't mince words about that. There is a godly standard, but there's a, there there's godly, and then there's cultural or societal okay. norms or acceptances for who we are as individuals. And a woman nursing her child is one of the most natural things a woman does in this lifetime. Amen. Of course it is. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jennifer? Yeah, I just want to say this. Just very simple. I can't hear you, Jennifer. Very, what you saying? You said. Jennifer, repeat. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can, hear, can you hear me. Uh -huh. Okay. I said just to kind of piggyback off of what Cynthia said and kind of re simplify it, there's a difference between what you were talking about. That's more tradition than it is religious. So in our tradition, we were taught what we should and should not do, but that has nothing to do with who Jesus is and what we, what, what we suppose, what, what our guidelines are religiously and what, what the Bible says. Okay. Right. Right. Oh, because oh, wow. like, like Reverend Edrick said, who, what, what we wear to church sometimes now the elders wouldn't agree with. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Right. I, and is, I, is yeah, anyone, I, I mean, a, it'd be different mm -hmm. if this was sinful activity. Is anyone defining nursing a child as a sin? Mm. But we're, but we're oh, demonizing okay. it because, because the sin mm -hmm. comes in mm -hmm. in the way we've sexualized bodies. Let's just be honest. Yep. We have sexual and, and what we're admitting is for some of us, self-control is a whole issue. But right? that's reality. We're worried, about that's our self -control. we're worried about other people's self-control because the mm. truth of the matter is there's not a whole lot of control going on. And we can admit that is a real issue. It is not to say that it would not be a distraction is a lie. Right? Okay. Also, I'm gonna say it. There are things that some other people do in the church that all that utterly distracts me. Yes. <laughs> there are worship <laughs> styles that some people do that can be utterly distracting. Yes. And yet there is room and there is mm. space and there is place. And so just because what is distracting for you, if it creates space and grace for another person, you know, and so these, this, this is just so the, com the conversations that at least should, we should at least be able to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. right? of course, of course. And, and, and how we adjust like etiquette isn't static. It changes over time. And so it used to be that we're going to come and we're going to come dressed and we're going to have a hat and we're going to do, and if we don't come, we're not showing that we're really giving God our best, right? That used to be the attitude. That used to be what was taught. Now we're just really glad if you make it to church, like multiple times, multiple Sundays in a month, we're like, oh, you did good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Etiquette has changed. Times have changed. I'm not saying what it necessarily needs to be, but we do need to be careful on differentiating where it is tradition and where it is a biblical principle at least all right because this is the reason why people will literally follow jesus and move mm -hmm. away from the church follow jesus and say i can't follow your guy and right. honestly on this issue that people are like i'm this is the reason it's breastfeeding at church is the reason why i'm not following it. but like this is the kind of discussion that for some people may be like you know what i can't i can't and we just need to try to find as much as for me it's how can we be as gracious as possible right how can we be as gracious as possible even sometimes it pushes past our comfort level because i mean jesus including a tax collector i wish we could find somebody who we knew was stealing money from people and put them in leadership put them in church leadership oh y'all be real uncomfortable y'all be real and you'd be like you sure about that that doesn't sound wise but Jesus did stuff sometimes um, that made its others uncomfortable. So, okay, that doesn't necessarily solve everything. I will say as an official, you know, response, because y'all may be wondering what is all that being said, what does that mean? It means that um, she has been told, she's been informed that she will be receiving a call from me. And if any one of y'all have anything to say to her, I'm going to freely tell her that she can call me and I'm going to talk to y'all. This is just, that's, uh -huh. That is the response. Leave her alone. Right. Leave, her alone. Leave her alone. Leave her alone. As long as she's staying in the back and she's kind of staying from the 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 media team has been has been told don't film her. They know. Just you know, keep cameras off. We want to make sure she is aware that there's a potential that a camera could come across her. 
So this is, this is, you know, a risk that she is taking, make her aware that is fine. Um, but in this particular case, just so you know, she's getting my number. And if, if y'all, y'all want to just make sure she knows. <laughs> y'all might I mean, hear. I think you should be able to be scared to do that. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not saying she should have fear from doing that. That's, that's not even something that should be associated with breastfeeding. You know what I mean? Like she should be able to be comfortable. I feel that, but. I just uh, was just thinking about just both sides of it, you know, just regardless of distractions. I was just thinking of both sides. Like, I get that. That's a natural thing. You know, I mean, I, I I get it. And I get that you could have somebody and like you got a kid who's a teenager and they're another. They're gonna, I get it. I get it. I get it. But in the same way, it's like, how can we be the most gracious to a person who's just trying to press her way forward? So yeah, I appreciate the discussion. Yeah, definitely, we definitely. are over time, um, but I, I appreciate the hearty discussion. Y'all came, y'all did great. Y'all did great. Y'all didn't even cuss anybody out. Everybody lived at the end. <laughs> right. I love y'all. Y'all are so good. Okay, reminder. Didn't know no better. The reminder that at 7 a.m., tomorrow's the day of a national day of prayer. Right. And so at 7 a.m., um, we are praying just like we do on Mondays. And so join us for prayer. You're going to get a text message. Tell your friends to expect that text message to jump on so we can pray and have a day of prayer and fasting from seven to seven. Yes, I said the word fasting. You may think, what are we fasting? Talk to the Lord about that tonight. Yes. The Lord. I'm not telling you what to fast, but I'm saying, you know, ask God and have God direct your steps on what you should or should not. Um, maybe you're adding something, maybe you're taking something away, um, but let that be um, something that you discuss um, with God. Um, let's continue to keep Pastor Riley lifted. I want to remind you, as he has reminded you, if you could do your best not to be like, how are you? How are you coping? Because that that question really triggers him. It makes him uncomfortable. And you got to think, it's not like there's one person asking or two people asking. It's like an entire congregation. That's very overwhelming. And so- yeah. As a reminder, you know, you see him at church, you know, um, say something, you know, that maybe keeps the spirit up or, you know, how much you love him and stuff like that, those type of things, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's just where he is right now, but do keep him lifted in prayer. Any other prayer requests? While you're thinking about prayer requests, also know a revival is coming up. And so we won't have upcoming Bible study because we will be having upcoming revival. And there is yet a word from the Lord. Um, so I'm um, starting. I'm not crazy. It's next Tuesday, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah next Tuesday. Praise the Lord. Yeah. It's already, it's already May. Um, uh, starting next Tuesday, every Tuesday, um, well, the 7th, 14th, and 21st. And we will be having revival. And so join us. We will not be having Bible study the following day. Any prayer requests that we've thought of? Well, I'm saying a little prayer that maybe we'll get to see that handsome son of yours. And you mentioned oh, maybe we okay. could at the okay. end. Oh, my mom's like, buddy, sleep. He's fine. He's oh, fine. I don't want to bother him. I don't oh, I always him. bother him. He's, <laughs> I always bother him. She's like, how am I going to bring it to the computer? All right. Let's see, baby. Okay. Yes, she is. Stop looking at me. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. We've been good. Like, mm -hmm. why, are you bothering me? why are you bothering me? You. <laughs> like notes right here. Okay, let's see. Okay, see, there we. He, he refuses to face you. He's just not. not yeah. Out. For those coming to sewing tomorrow, because we're now out of uh, sabbatical. So sewing is tomorrow. And because my mom comes to sewing, that means I'll have Prince in the office tomorrow. <laughs> so if you want to catch Prince, at some point, he normally wakes up at some point during sewing. So. What time is sewing? And do you have to bring your own machine? or how does that work? You can, It's best if you bring your own, but we have machines there. So okay. it's so best to work on your own but if you you can come and you don't have to bring anything but yourself okay <laughs> if i bring my own will you show me how to use it <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. somebody okay. else. oh yeah okay. yeah it's it's for beginners and so a lot of times people we're, we're like from the very beginning and people okay. and it's amazing how much people have grown mm -hmm. learning and sewing <laughs> and doing stuff so yeah girl come on come on <laughs> Mm -hmm. um i just i just like i'm just a cheerleader 
I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> quilting cheerleader. 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock. 12 to 3. 12, 12 o'clock to 3. Okay. Sorry, mm -hmm. quick plug, women's tea, uh, women renewed is going to be May 11th at 11 a.m. $50 proceeds go to our scholarships, the Martha J. Christmas and Dr. Alice Price scholarships. Hope to see all ladies, men, everyone uh, in attendance. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions, please uh, let me know. Sure, that sounds awesome. I know I will be there. I'm <laughs> I'm bringing, and I'm bringing my mom. I don't know. Mom, you're coming. Okay. Uh, awesome. Can I make an announcement? Go for it. Our uh, In Unison Community Concert is going to be Sunday night at 7 o'clock. And it's a free concert. We always do this free concert for the community every year. And this year it's going to be at Shalom, City of Peace. And what, oh. At what time? At 7. That's, seven. that's okay. good. Awesome. <laughs> yes, I'll be able to come. That sounds good. Any other uh, announcements? Any other church announcements, prayer requests, praise reports? I can give a praise report. You know, I haven't walked in uh, five weeks and they've been trying to find out. I've been in the machines, my head been in the machine, my back been in the machine, my legs been in the machine. They find nothing. And yesterday, they sent me to the foot doctor, and she found what it was. It was the uh, uh, something in my ankle is very weak, and that's why I've been falling. Mm. So that's good. They put a brace on my foot, and I'm moving on. I took ah. God, God is good. Yes, he is all the time. Praise God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Praise God for the diagnosis. Yes. That way you can continue to heal and be restored. And we're, we're trusting God for that. The uh, orthopedic, she had did a CAT scan and she compared it with the one from 2020. And um, she called me eight o'clock that night. She said, it is nothing wrong with your back. Nothing. Everything is in place. <laughs> she said, you need then she tried to get me to go tell my primary doctor that I need to go to a stroke doctor. He hit the ceiling. <laughs> he hit the ceiling. You do not need to, you haven't had a stroke. Oh, look at that. So face. I do the therapy. I told my therapist, they said, You ain't had no stroke. And you see, I didn't. And they said, That's all right. Get you back better than you was. When right. you, you know, stop coming. Because I'm going to walk down that aisle. I'll probably walk all over the church this time. <laughs> she's, gonna, she's not going to walk. She's going to run. Uh, yeah. There he is. It's going to start with the praise. It's gonna, she's going to start praising the Lord and it's going to be a done deal. That's right. And mm -hmm. I already said, nobody better not come and say, you need to sit down. I've been no. sitting <laughs> 24 years I've been like this. I, you can't tell me, sit down, look at that boy. Oh my God. Look at him. <laughs> See, he'd be so unbothered when he want to be, but this is not always how he looks. I just want y'all to know because y'all be, oh, he's so well behaved. He's so <laughs> he's I'll, so have, I'll get the whole mind. Sometimes it's true. Sometimes. He is so handsome. He's so fresh. He's so hey, cute. Baby. He yes. is he yes. is kind of cute. Me and Peter decided yes. we don't keep him. Yes. Um, yes. It's adorable. All yeah. right. Let's go ahead and pray out. I hope you do join me tomorrow um, as we uh, start our morning in prayer. And then as we um, continue 12 hours of prayer and fasting. So please continue praying throughout the day. And then um, intercessory prayers back as we are back off of sabbatical um, tomorrow at 7 p.m. Um, let's pray. God, we thank you. Um, we thank you for how you just show up. We thank you for how present you are. We thank you not just for your teachings, but we appreciate your teachings. We thank you um, for the narratives, um, but we, we know, we believe by faith um, that you are God, that you are bigger than our problems, that you care about us, that you are concerned about us, that you work 
and for our good. And for that, we just give you praise. Uh, we pray that you would teach us and show us um, how to give grace that we don't want to become a stumbling block for somebody else, Lord God. And we realize there are going to be times that we're going to be uncomfortable, that there are times, but we're not going to quite know how to get it right. Um, but the good news is in all things, we can look to you. So we ask for your guidance. We ask for um, your direction for how to deal with even difficult things, things that um, we don't quite have the answer for, things that we don't quite have the words for, um, because we know that you will speak to us, that you will direct us and that you will give us the right way to go. Um, we pray for, um, we thank, we give thanks for um, Miss Loretta as she has been diagnosed. And we know that the restoration and the walking and the running is coming. Um, yeah. Yeah, she would cover Pastor Riley as he continues um, in this bereavement of his um, grandmother. Yeah. Yes. Um, we pray um, for our church. We pray for a revival, Lord God. We need to be mm -hmm. revived with all the stress and the worries and the concerns that come out from the political climate and everything on the news and all the things on the yes. local news, Lord God. We need a revival. We need a word. We need to be restored. Yes. And so, God, we are preparing our hearts and our minds as we look to um, commune with you even closer tomorrow as we um, pay extra close attention to our relationship with you and, and um, give you even more attention to tomorrow on the national day of prayer it is an anticipation of this revival that we know that you are sending to central and we give you praise in advance in jesus name we do pray amen amen amen, amen. amen. all right amen. Good, night, everybody. Good, night. Uh -huh. good night thanks that so much like, go away <laughs> good night everyone me not y'all bye bye, bye. 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 bye.